Great job, guys. Good morning, and welcome to New Hope Church. Today, we are doing the first of five messages looking at the intersection of faith and science. And so, uh, last August, we got the good news that the John Templeton Foundation, run out of the States, was willing to give us a $30,000 grant to explore the intersection of faith and science. What was unique about New Hope Church's proposal is how we preach these scientific things, not the morals and ethics of kidney trade in the world, not, uh, nothing to do with moralizing or ethicizing. I can't think of a third word. I wish I could have there, but so I'll repeat myself and then embarrassingly go on about it. Not about that, but about the actual kidney itself, the, the, this biologically beautiful, miraculous, works in a certain way, internal organ. What does the nature of that thing teach us about the nature of God, the maker of all things? So that's where we're going this morning. As I said earlier, this is uh, Dr. Garth Mortis. He is a kidney doctor and nephrologist here in Calgary. I when did I meet you first? Less than a year ago, maybe. You yep. guys started coming to New Hope, and yep. I found out what you did for a living, and I thought, research assistant for a sermon on the kidney one day. <laughs> and here we are. So yeah. I've asked Garth to uh, just give us Kidney 101 and share some of what he's passionate about and what he does. And then after he's done, I'll come up and do the, uh, the rest of the sermon. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Step one is complete. I got up here without tripping, so that's always good. Um, I was, I'm just going to start out a little bit just to describe myself. That always makes it feel better because if I make mistakes, then you, don't, then you can feel sorry for me as opposed to wonder who I, I really am. Um, so anyway, I am Gar- I'm Garth Mortis. I'm a physician here in town. I haven't always been a physician. This is actually my third career. I started out as, well, my first career was quite short. I was a professional actor to start out with. And then I went in and I was in computers for 12 years to work downtown Calgary at the oil patch. And then uh, when I was 29, I uh, can remember the day precisely, I called my, I was in Kamloops visiting with my mom and uh, my wife was here in town and I uh, called her up and said, you know what, I think I've decided to be a doctor. And it was silence on the other end and then, uh, bless her heart, she said, well, if that's what you want to do, you better get busy. So uh, I had to go back and do pre-med and then go into medicine. My eldest daughter was just starting kindergarten when I started back at uh, university. Um, And my goal was to be a family doctor because that's actually less training. But as times went through, I ended up getting, first of all, my specialty in general internal medicine and then a specialty in nephrology. So 12 years later, I finally had a job. So my my eldest daughter was in grade 11 at that point, so at least I graduated before she did. Yeah. So that's my medical background. Um, I'm a nephrologist, and then you look at that word and you think, well, you know, what is that? It's very typical of medicine. We have this mystery around words that makes us feel smarter, you know, intimidate people. So we use these words that nobody really understands. But nephrologist, if you actually break it down to the Greek, just means pertaining to the study of the kidney. So it's easier for me to say nephrologist than a high I study the kidney. So that's really what a nephrologist is, it's in, uh, and we use words a lot like that, and, and we're not alone in that. If you actually look back, um, if you even look at the Bible, I mean, for decades, nobody could understand the Bible. It was written in a language that really nobody spoke. Well, not many people smoke, spoke. Most people didn't read. And then in the 1500s, it was translated into a common language, at that point, German, uh, by Martin Luther, and then opened up everything. So now all of a sudden, people could read the Word. They could understand the Word and take away some of the mystery of the Word. And that's really what we want to do is get understanding. Well, what's this got to do with faith and science? Well, we all know what faith is, but what is science? Again, if you take science back to the root, it's from Latin, and it basically means knowledge. So it's really an understanding of mysteries. And um, so that's really what we're going to talk about today is just a little bit about the mystery of this amazing organ called, um, called the kidney. It's not unusual. I mean, kidney itself, um, if, you, if you get right down to it, it's actually mentioned in the Bible 48 times. It's mentioned by two different, sometimes it's used the words kidneys, and sometimes it uses the word reins, R-E-I-N-S, which is, translate means the kidney. Most of it has to do with sacrifice, and and the kidney was actually a really important organ during uh, first sacrifice, and because it was thought back in biblical times that the kidney was actually the root of all emotions and desires, 
Um, so it wasn't the heart, it was actually the kidney that was responsible for all that. And not only that, they knew that you had two of them and they thought all the good emotion and desire came from the right side and all the bad emotion and desire came from the left side. So the body was in constant kind of battle and balance with these two kidneys. Um, so that's the sacrifice. And then it actually goes on and the kidney is actually talked about in other places. For instance, in Psalm 26, it says, examine me, O Lord, and prove me Try my reins and heart, your kidneys and heart. Look at me and look at my heart and see what's happening. And the last one is actually, uh, another one is in, I found very interesting, it was in Revelations, and it says, I will searcheth uh, your reins and heart, and I will give unto you every one of you according to your works. So it actually says that you're going to be judged by your kidneys. So that's the way that the biblical time looked at. We know that the kidney actually does lots more other things also, and it does a lot of science. If I could actually get the next slide. So this is how we view kidneys, or if you ever think about kidneys, this is how we view them, as these two kind of bean-shaped things with lots of blood, and they generate urine. Um, so we have two of them, although we only need one. Um, so interestingly, how we know that is actually during World War I, there was a lot of people shot on the battlefield. And because there's so much blood in a kidney, they ended up taking out a lot of them. So that we ended up following these people, and we know that they, you can live perfectly well with one kidney. And it's because of those studies we're actually allowed to donate kidneys to people. So that's where the donation comes from, and that's how we know that you can have one. Um, so the main point of kidneys is actually something called homeostasis. If I could get the next slide, actually. So homeostasis is a fancy word. Again, one of these words we can break down. It's, again, from the Greek. If you break it down, it basically literally means body static or body equal. So it's all about balance and equilibrium. So the kidney's job in, is to keep you in balance. Um, we live in a world where we're consumed by eating potato chips and pop and all that kind of stuff. And all these things that go into your body have to be very balanced in, the, in them to, to survive. The kidney can only uh, tolerate about a 3% change in a salt or in water or anything like that. Other than that, you get really sick. So the body has to be able to handle this. Um, so that's really uh, what homeostasis is about. We'll get the next slide. Two fancy words coming out of this is something called osmoregulator versus osmoconformer. So now osmoconformer, osmo is uh, osmolarity. So you've got to maintain balance over the membrane. So the difference between these, all animals are basically broken into two categories, osmoconformers versus osmoregulators. So an osmoconformer is, is an animal that has to rely on the outside environment to be able to keep itself balanced. And a perfect example of this are fish. So a, a uh, saltwater fish cannot live in freshwater. If you put a saltwater fish in freshwater, it's going to die. And if you put a freshwater fish in saltwater, it will die. It's because it can't regulate itself. Humans fit into the osmoregulators, and that means that we can control the inside of our body uh, despite many changes in the environment. So because of the kidneys, we can go and live in the Arctic, or we can live in the desert, we can live in a temperate area, we can swim. All those kinds are because of the kidneys keeping our bodies in balance. And if you think back, we were actually told to go forth and multiply and fill the earth, but we could never do that if we didn't have kidneys, because we have to be able to adapt. And that's what kidneys are really very good at. But when we get back to how the kidney actually works, I'll get the next slide, if you remember back to your grade 9 science, okay, so this is called a nephron, okay, and this is the functional unit of your kidney. Um, there's about a million of these in each one of your kidneys, um, and there's really, it's broken down into three components. One is the filter up there called the glomerulus. There's also the tubule, which takes the filtered load and makes urine, and then there's the blood vessels. So we're going to take a little bit of time and just describe what that goes on inside this kidney. So the glomerulus, or I'll call it filter because it's easier to say, so the filter sees about 1,700 liters of blood every day. Okay, if you think that there's seven and a half liters of blood in your body, it's going around a whole lot of times and it's seeing it. In fact, the kidney sees more blood than any other organ other than the heart. Okay, so it sees 1,700 liters, which is about half of a, half of a standard size swimming pool. So that's how much blood that the, the, goes to the kidney. It goes through a filter, um, and this filter restricts, pushes the uh, things that you don't want, 
and it keeps the things you do. So it keeps things like anything that's large sized or has a big charge on it. So it's going to keep things like your red blood cells, your white blood cells, um, your albumin or your proteins, your cholesterol, all that kind of stuff stays inside your bloodstream and the other stuff is filtered. So it filters about 180 liters into the tubule every day. Okay, so now if all the kidney did was filter that and then put it out, you would pee 180 liters every day. That's about half a bathtub. But not only that, if it peed that out, you'd also have to replace it. So you'd have to drink 180 liters or really 181 liters of electrolyte fluid every day. So if that was the case, you would be in front of the fridge or in the bathroom all day long because they really couldn't do anything else. So the kidney does other stuff. So in the first part of the tubule there, called the proximal tubule, this, the, this is where the kidney gets really interesting. So you take this filter, and then all of a sudden, it examines this filtrate and starts removing everything that's good out of it. In fact, 65% of that stuff that's filtered is then reabsorbed into the body because the body says, I need this. And that's things like glucose, amino acids, your, your sodium, your um, your potassium, um, that kind of stuff is reabsorbed into the kidney. You then go into the thing called the loop of Henle um, and the rest of the tubule, and that's really about fine-tuning salts. So it makes sure that your body is equal in its, again, sodium and your potassium and your calcium and your magnesium, and it's either absorbing it or secreting it back in, depending on how level your body has to get. And then the last part of the tubule is where it looks after um, acid-base, products and water. So this is where we're trying to take that 180 liters and get it down, okay? Now this is a really cool area of the kidney because what it does is um, it actually, if it thinks you're dehydrated or needs water, it's going to put little water tubules in there and the water is going to be reabsorbed. And if you don't need it, those don't have those water tubules and it just flows through. So if we look at the kidney, you, you got 1,700 liters shown to the kidney, 180 liters get into the kidney, and by the time it gets through all these tubules, you're left with waste that comes out in about 500 mils, or about a, up to about a liter and a half. So the kidney actually figures out all the stuff it needs, reabsorbs it, and puts out this tiny amount of, of waste product, which is really, I mean, when you think about it, it's extremely fascinating. The thing that, you know, I've been working with a kidney for 20 years and I still get excited. I mean, John called me a kidney geek, I think is what you called me. Um, but I really get excited because you look at this tubule and you think, wow, all that work that goes into that tubule. And if you took that tubule and you stretched it out, it would be one and a half centimeters long. If you think of that in, you know, imperial measure like I do, that's less than half an inch. All that activity happens in this little space. Um, granted, there's a million of them, but what an engineering feat that is to be able to produce all that stuff and do it within one and a half centimeters. Um, so if your kidneys don't work, so if all of a sudden your kidneys stopped working, you, would, you can survive about five days. Okay, so you can live five days without any kidney function. Not well, but you can survive five days. People who gradually have kidney failure go on to something called dialysis, which is kidney replacement. I'm actually a dialysis doctor. That's one of my major roles is look after people on dialysis. So with all our engineering, we've been doing dialysis for more than 50 years. Um, with all our kind of knowledge of it, can we recreate a kidney? Absolutely not. We actually only look at a couple of the functions, the acid base, the salt, or the toxin removal, and the water kind of control. But we can only, despite all our kind of science, we can only replace less than 10% of kidney function with our dialysis machines. We're not very good at it. In fact, we're so poor at it that the average life expectancy on dialysis is only two years. Okay, so that's how long we can typically ask. So 50% of our patients will be dead within two years after starting dialysis. Now, that's not everybody. I have a patient that's been on dialysis for 35 years. She's the longest living in Calgary. Um, but we're looking at that. So one of the things we can talk and do is kidney transplant, and we talked about that earlier, where you can give up a kidney. Uh, the problem is, in southern Alberta, uh, kidney transplant waiting list is about four to five years. And if the average life expectancy is two years, you can see that there's a huge math problem there. So we have a lot of people dying uh, waiting for a kidney transplant. Um, so 
again, what does this all this science stuff say about you know anything? So you know, so if you want to drop a conclusion, what I really want to say is, the kidney is the organ responsible for balance. It makes uh, the body react the way it's supposed to. When you look at the actual way it works, the fascinating thing is it takes this filtered load of 180 liters, and then it actually takes out everything that's good. So you imagine being able to take out everything that's good and then just secreting this very small amount of 500 mils of toxic waste. So this, it filters, and it, it takes this huge load, looks at everything you have, and says, this is what's good, and it brings it back in. And by the time it comes out, you have this 500 mils of toxic kind of material. So the kidney is very good at separating what's good from what's bad for your body. Okay, so hopefully that's enough information that's for it, you. Man. Perfect. Thank okay. you. That's a great setup. Oops. Want to grab my water? Thanks, Garth. When Jesus came to redeem, renew, and remake the cosmos, I do not think that his intent was that the ongoing expression of his life in the world would be a community of people and individuals who are always talking about toxins and have their heads in their toilets, as it were. I think he came so that we would be known by what is good, our love, and our patience, and our kindness, and our goodness, and our self-control, and the faithfulness with which we deal with other people, our friends, our community, the love that we share was what he was all about. The goal of the incarnation, God coming from heaven to earth, was so that Jesus could show us what life is meant to look like through his words and maybe even more so through his being there and then who he was in being here. And yes, dying for sin so that the toxins can be dealt with and we can move on. But that is so 0.5 liter in the equation of the 1,800 liters that visit the kidney. Those proportions, I think, are true in terms of what it means to be a follower of Christ and to build His kingdom and to make His kingdom whole and fully alive and healthy again. Jesus came to remake and renew and accentuate and remind us of what is right, even as He showed us what was wrong and died for our sins. Out of the 1,800 liters of mostly good blood that visits the kidneys per day, a mere 0.5 to 1.5 liters will be peed away. And at the end of the day, all of the evil and brokenness and pain and suffering and tears and loss and everything that has so brought pain and hurt into our lives, at the end of the day, that 0.5 liters out of that whole big system will be peed away and go down the toilet forever. This is God's good earth. Let your kidneys preach that to you. And live into all that is right for His glory. Amen.